Okay. So hi everyone and welcome to this meetup, which is brought to you by PyData in collaboration with the Munich NLP, which is like a community that you can find on Discord. And there is like even a link to join the Discord here. So you can always join and get uh, into more discussions with the with the community on NLP related topics. With that said, uh, let's get into today's event. So today we have Vincent who has graciously agreed to talk to us about some trips, tips and tricks from the NLP land. And if you have heard the recruiter uh, joke where you had a bunch of like big data technologies along with some Pokemon name, Pokemon names in between, that's apparently credited to Vincent as well. So you can find the Google search for his name associated with it. And yeah, so Vincent basically works uh, as a machine learning engineer at Explosion AI. And he has also developed a lot of cool open source libraries related to the scikit-learn and other machine learning technologies. And today he's here to share with us some cool tricks from NLP without using GPUs. So over to you again. Cool. Um, so uh, we've got a. Uh, before we get started, we have to click a few buttons, I think, because uh, how do I share my screen now? Uh, oh, hang on. Did I, did I just accidentally close Zoom? Oh, no, wait, there it is. There it is. Okay, grand. Uh, open up the chat so I can see that as well. Share screen, desktop. There we go, I think. Um, just to confirm, um, this is a Jupyter notebook, and people can see me doodle. Once or twice. Yes. Good. Yes. yes. Cool. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent. Uh, and what I'm going to do in this session is I'm just going to be sort of pretending like I'm in a classroom and I'll be whiteboarding and live coding a bit. Um, I've, I've prepared a couple of demos, which I think in general are pretty cool. Um, but what I'm going to be trying to do is just have kind of more of an interactive session. Um, uh, people are tuning in, uh, so you have to be able to ask questions and stuff, because otherwise, uh, why would you tune in? You can just watch it on YouTube. Um, so what I will be doing a lot of today as well is just uh, drawing and doing schematic diagrams and such. Um, but what probably would be a cool idea is, like, if you have questions, to so go ahead and ask them. Uh, and I'm going to try to, like, every 15 minutes or so, just have a little bit of time uh, for people to sort of ask me questions and clarify, et cetera. Um, but yeah, um, my name is Vincent. Uh, I work at a company called Explosion. Um, some of the tools that we make are, um, you might've heard of them. So uh, Spacey would be like one of the big tools that we work on. Um, there's also a labeling tool called Prodigy, um, which I'm gonna show in a bit as well. It's also part of the stuff uh, that we do. Um, but that's the, the world, uh, sort of professional world realm that I'm, uh, working in. Uh, outside of that realm, of course, I'm also doing lots of stuff in scikit-learn. Uh, scikit-learn uh, land. Um, and one thing that uh, both of these realms have in common in general is that uh, both tend to have this preference of keeping things lightweight. Um, there are lots of models out there and lots of approaches where um, you have to use a GPU. Um, and in particular, I'm kind of looking at you, uh, Hugging Face. Um, lots of cool stuff in there, but a lot of these algorithms need heavy compute power. Uh, and I would just kind of like to talk to, uh, of talk about in this sort of session, is just a little bit more of the theory and the tricks and maybe some of the tools from the more lightweight uh, ecosystems. Because there's tricks that you can do to uh, prevent a whole lot of GPUs from being necessary. Um, and I'd like to think that some of the tricks are maybe just uh, slightly underappreciated as well. Um, so um, with that in mind, uh, let's do a little bit of programming. Um, and just to check, uh, there was one person. Uh, there we go. Yep. Okay. I can see a couple of people tune in. Uh, that's great. Um, so what I'm about to do is I'm about to do some live coding. And there's a few people with their webcams on. Uh, and if I'm going too fast, I'm going to use their facial expression as sort of the proxy. Um, but you can, of course, if I'm going too fast, also just type in the in the chat bot uh, chat box. That's also just uh, fine. Um, but basically, what I have here um, is Scikit Learn. Um, it's a Jupyter notebook, uh, and I'm grabbing pandas. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to this um, URL over here, and I'm feeding that uh, into pandas. Uh, not everyone knows this, but uh, pandas can accept a local file, but you can also just give it a URL and it will just download the file for you. 
Um, and this is a, a subset of the IMDb uh, data set, which is the, the big sentiment data set for movies. And um, back in the day, and I think still today, people spend a lot of effort uh, writing down their feelings about a particular movie. And um, so there's people who are then interested in automatically detecting whether or not the review was like someone enjoyed it or someone totally didn't. Um, so, you know, the data frame kind of looks like this. It's just a very long bit of text. Um, and then uh, I think zero means it wasn't a great movie for that one person. And one means it was a good movie. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, well, let's grab it out of a data frame, put that in a nice little Python list. Um, so just to give an impression, uh, these are actually kind of like long reviews, right? It's not like a single sentence that says, hey, I liked it or I hated it. It's actually kind of long. Um, but then, of course, what you would like to do is maybe take a bit of text like this and turn it into a prediction. So how can you do that inside of Scikit-Learn? And what are just some basic tricks that people like to do here? Well, for starters, the main thing you got to do is you got to wonder, well, scikit-learn, right? Like logistic regression and these kinds of algorithms, they like to work with arrays of numbers. They don't like to directly work on top of text. So what you got to do first is figure out some sort of a way to take all of these bits of text uh, and turn them into something numeric. Um, and there's a couple of ways of going about that. I'm definitely going to share a couple. Um, but I do want to maybe start with this one trick called a count vectorizer, which is, I think, the basics, uh, like the, the, the first thing people like to do in, uh, in like NLP class. Uh, the way it just kind of works is let's say I have a big uh, text database, uh, which just contains all of my texts, and I'm not even looking at the label. Uh, and then let's say I have a sentence, um, my dog is cool. Just let's say that's a sentence. And then basically what we're doing is we're splitting the text up um, such that we have separate tokens. And then each token is going to get indexed. So we have something like, okay, my, um, we have a very long vector, let's say with many different zeros, but there is an index in this vector for the word my, uh, there is another index um, for the word dog, let's say. Uh, and what I can then do is if I have a training procedure where I'm going to look over all the different texts, all the different tokens, and every single token that I've seen is associated with like an index in this array, then you will end up with like a very big array with many, many different zeros. And in this case, like four indexes will have a, a one in there, um, basically indicating the presence of a word, right? So uh, let's do one over there and uh, another one over here. And this would be like a representation of a bit of text. Um, and this is something that you can definitely pass on to an algorithm, uh, something like uh, logistic regression. That's something that you can totally do. Um, and just to show how the, the code of that would look like, if you're doing this inside of scikit-learn, uh, you would use a, a pipeline, so to say. So uh, you have a transformer component called a count vectorizer. Um, you have a machine learning component called a logistic regression. Uh, and you can just make this pipeline uh, by saying, let's first take the text and turn it into something numeric. Uh, that then gets passed to a logistic regression. If you want to be clever about it, uh, usually it's a good idea to set the class weights to balanced. This way, if there's an imbalance in your data set, the algorithm tries to accommodate for that. And what you can then go ahead and do is you can have this pipe object then uh, fit to the data, which means that um, in this step, just in this fit part over here, um, first I'll be training the count vectorizer, then a logistic regression. Uh, then I have a pipeline that's been trained and, uh, you know, you can call predict then as well. Um, lo and behold, uh, we're able to make some predictions. So if, if you're aware of scikit learn, nothing that I've just told you should be too surprising, but I do hope like giving this a bit of an introduction so far, so good. But then you can wonder like, is this actually enough, right? Uh, like a very good question at this point could be, well, is it, is it realistic that we're going to solve many problems with this? Um, and there are many tasks that we're interested in machine learning uh, for natural language processing. But if I just limit myself to classification, is this enough? Like, can we cover a lot of ground with this uh, approach? And I will say, well, there's a couple of things you're not going to be able to do well here. So let's go back to the drawing board. Um, I am going to uh, erase some stuff. Uh, let's maybe just erase all of it. Um, and let's now say that like uh, I have a data set trained with uh, text like uh, this movie 
was awesome, right? And I have my big array with my, for my count factorizer, right? So each of the words that I've seen so far is going to get mapped. And then probably for sentiment, the most important word is this one, right? The word awesome. If that appears, I'm probably dealing with a positive sentiment thing. So let's say that uh, during training, uh, we have an index associated with it. So far, so good. But then if I think about real life, especially if I'm dealing with social media data, people are probably going to make typos, especially if, you're, if they're using devices like this, right? Um, like I've got pretty fat fingers, like I usually write down the wrong character. And then the big downside of this approach really is that if a person writes down uh, awesome with an M, like without the E at the end, then right now we are dealing with a token that just really doesn't appear in this thing at all. And therefore, the most important word, if it's just slightly misspelled, it's not able to give any information anymore to the logistic regression. And you could wonder, well, how often do spelling errors really happen? And that's a fair discussion to have. But this is like a like the first failure scenario that I can easily come up with, indicating that maybe this count vectorizer model is not going to do it for me. There is, however, a trick. Um, I actually think it's a pretty neat one, but uh, it's a trick that not everyone likes to use. Um, so let's go back. This count factorizer comes with a couple of settings that we could go ahead and explore. Um, and one um, bit of advice, like one thing that you can do if you're working inside of a Jupyter notebook, there is this thing called a contextual helper that not, not everyone knows about. And the way it just kind of works is I can move my cursor over a object um, and then usually, yeah. Oh, it has to be like an instantiated object. Okay, fine. So CV equals count vectorizer. If I just run this and then if I put my cursor on CV, then I actually get the doc string. So if you are interested in like, hey, what are all the different settings? Uh, this is actually kind of a convenient way to just go ahead and explore it. And if I just look at this big doc string, uh, class vectorizer, Okay, I've got an encoding. Uh, that's a setting I can add as an input. Uh, I can choose a strip accents. Uh, I can force all the characters to be lowercase. I mean, these are all things that are pretty interesting. But the main thing that's of interest is this one, the n-gram range and the analyzer. Now, what I'm, what I'm able to do with these two parameters, if I just kind of go back here, is I'm able to sort of say, well, maybe I don't want to index just a single word. Maybe I also want to index these two words after each other. Like maybe the combinations of two words in sequence is actually the thing I want to put in this index over here. And sure, you know, your vocabulary is going to blow up. You're going to get a much bigger array over here. But at least you do get more information, so that can be useful. But you can also say, well, maybe I just I don't really care about the full token. Maybe what I'm going to do for a word like awesome, maybe I'm going to say I care more about the characters. So I'm going to say from the word awesome, I'm going to take these three grams. It's kind of like the sliding window of characters over this one word. So then you get A, W, E, uh, W, E, S, uh, E, S, O, uh, O, M, E. Like those are the, the three grams, so to say, from that one word. And notice that if I were to use this, and it, let's suppose that I had this big array over here that was indexed with these trigrams instead, well, kind of the neat thing here would be that you can kind of say, well, now uh, let's just do a count. Let's, let's, let's pretend that we are dealing uh, with this one spelling error over here. Well, then I wouldn't have this one anymore. Like that trigram kind of falls off. But I would still have access to these three, right? So it, like when I have a spelling error like this one, uh, that's definitely still something that I should be able to see in here if this appears like in, in real life, so to say. And that's actually kind of a clever trick if you think about it, um, because uh, this is a trick that doesn't just work for English, it actually works for a whole bunch of languages. Um, English is a relatively simple language, right? Um, but I believe a, a language like, oh, I don't know, like German probably, like many languages have this. So in English, I can say, I say, or you say, um, and the verb is the same, right? There's only one, there's two conjugations possible in different languages, but in English is just one. Um, and also things like city, cities, um, usually when there's a conjugation of a word or when there's like a plural, um, you have this little bit of extra text. Um, 
And if there's a spelling error in that extra bit of text, but in the beginning part of that text, it wasn't there. That's also a pretty nice way of dealing with it. And I especially like Finnish, I think is a language that has this a lot. That has lots of different uh, conjugations, so to say. So um, that's a pretty neat trick. Um, and if you want to do that properly inside of scikit-learn, uh, one thing I advise you to do is you can uh, also make a union pipeline, so to say. And what you're then able to do is you're able to add two count vectorizers next to each other. But you're able to say, well, one of these count vectorizers uses the character analyzer and has an n-gram range of two to three, maybe? That kind of feels semi-appropriate. Um, and what this is going to do is basically, um, or actually, I think I could learn these days is fancy, and I can actually just show you like this. Um, you're basically going to get a pipeline where the text goes through two count vectorizers. One count vectorizer just takes all the separate words, and the other one actually just has a look at these character engrams. And this already is like a fair bit more robust, uh, which is definitely kind of nice. Um, but there are some other tricks that you could do too. Like this is a trick, right? If you want to deal with spelling errors. Um, but there are some other ones that might be worth discussing as well. Because there's actually like another problem, if you think of it. I can come up with another problem and put it that way. So let's say I have a, a text data set, right? Like it's a very, 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 very big one. So uh, I'm going to call that X, but X is now just a long list of lots and lots of text. Um... So one kind of issue maybe is that this is a text file with, I don't know, 10 gigabytes or like some, some arbitrarily large number such that having this data set in memory is actually kind of a bit painful. Can we still learn from a data set like this? Because, you know, text files can get kind of big if you think about it. Uh, tabular data has like a column that's all numeric. You can do fancy compression tricks. But the moment that you're dealing with something like this, hmm, maybe we need to, maybe we need to rethink. So one thing that you could do, uh, and some algorithms do this, um, is you could say, well, let's cut up this data set and let's maybe take our machine learning algorithm, which is this box, and let's first give it like chunk one. And then I have like a box that's already seen some data. Then I'm gonna give it chunk two. And this is kind of what people do with neural networks, right? They just have like a batch that goes in, so to say. And when you think about it, this is actually kind of a nice trick. Um, you can go through all the separate files once, and then you could loop over it again if you're worried about like numerical convergence and whatnot. But theoretically, nothing is stopping you from doing this trick where you're just giving it batches at the same time. And not a lot of people know this, but scikit-learn totally supports this. So usually inside of scikit-learn, you have the fit predict API. But inside of scikit-learn, not every component, but some of the components have a partial fit um, way of fitting. Uh, there's a couple of uh, to transformers and there's a couple of machine learning models uh, that besides the fit method also implement the partial fit method. And the partial fit method actually implements this. You're able to give it a separate batch every single time around. And that's kind of cool, right? Um, especially for dealing with bigger and bigger data sets, we might just have a trick up our sleeve that also allows us to deal with that. Now, for numerical convergence, one thing we do have to worry about a bit is that, you know, if you're training a model, you're going through all of these separate data sets, so to say, it will be kind of a shame if maybe the performance in this set is really good, but in this set, it's really bad because more recently, this data has been seen, right? Like if you're going through and you're learning one step at a time, um, you might be forgetting what you've learned earlier in the process, so to say. There's like a thing that could go wrong. So probably if you're going to be doing this, you might want to randomly create these batches just to sort of prevent that. So it's not a free lunch, right? But that's like stuff that you could do. But in general, there's also like another thing if you want to do this um, that you're going to have to worry a bit about. And that's related to the count vectorizer that I mentioned before. So one step back. The way the count vectorizer works is we have words like uh, my dog is great. And if these were all the words that I see so far, then I would have a count vectorizer array 
with four indices because it's, it's only seen four words and it's able to map each word to this index and that's it. So if we pretend that this was the first batch of data that I saw and the next batch of data had something like my cat is silly, well then, hang on, uh, if I want to put the word cat in here, then I have to make this count vector array larger because the word cat didn't appear originally. And even though my and is are in there, like the word silly also didn't appear, so I need to make this larger. Oh, but that's also kind of annoying because I have a, if I have a logistic regression that's training here, uh, the logistic regression is not going to like it that suddenly the, the input size increases, right? <laughs> like suddenly I need more coefficients in there. Like, ah, oh, it's going to be a super annoying API. Hmm. So that's not going to be great. Uh, and moreover, the thing is also going to be hurt. What's also going to hurt us a lot uh, is the fact that, you know, if I have a huge data set, which might be the reason why we're doing this, then this is also going to break because the count vector array might also just get huge in the uh, in this process as well, right? So that's also going to be a bit painful. So let's do a bit of a trick, uh, something that might help us here. So again, um, let's let's be a little bit abstract here. Let's say I've got like word one, uh, word two, uh, word three, all the way up until like I don't know word. K and K is like super large. These are all the different words that we've seen. And let's also assume we've cleaned this. So like no capital letters, et cetera. We still have lots and lots of words. Then what we could say is, well, that's great, but we're still going to map this to an array that's always going to be constant. Let's say that I am interested in having a vocabulary of size 10,000 and no larger. Then is there a way where I can sort of squeeze this in? And one thing that you could do is you could say, well, let's take each word and let's hash it. Um, so I am going to hash word one uh, and out comes like some fixed, but somewhat random number. Like the whole property of a hashing function is uh, if the same thing goes in, the same number comes out, but it's very hard to predict up front what number actually goes out. And if I then take that number and if I mod that uh, with my vocabulary size, then I can guarantee that whatever word I have here just always maps to a index in this vocabulary. Now, the downside of this is at some point I am going to hit like a collision, right? That's definitely going to happen. Let's say that, boom, there's going to be like a collision that's happening here. So it's definitely not going to be perfect. But I do get the benefit that, you know, um, it's relatively constrained, and I, I don't have to worry about like, my vocabulary exploding. But hang on, we can do another trick. <laughs> um, and this is a trick I learned from Spacey. Like this is one of the tricks that Spacey uses internally. If, if we are afraid of this collision happening here, right? How about we fix that by not just hashing once, but hashing a few times? So I have like hashing function uh, A, I've got hashing function B, and I've got hashing function C, let's say, uh, all for the same word. Uh, and again, I'm doing the mod thing for all of these, right? There we go. Uh, but that basically means that each word is now going to populate three elements. So let's use a gray icon for that. So it's going to populate this one and this one and this one, let's say. Now, in this case, suppose that there is a collision, right? So let's say that word K over here, it has a collision with the first with the, uh, with the first hash. So the, the situation we had before, like hash A from uh, this one, hash A from WK is having a collision. So that one is also going there. So that would be bad. Like we have a collision over here. Well, then the probability that hash function B and C will also collide here is super small. So even though I might hit some overlap some of the time, I will probably never hit all the overlap any of the time, which is kind of a neat little probabilistic property of embedding things this way. Um, and inside of Spacey, this is how stuff is actually encoded. Um, this doesn't exist in scikit-learn yet. Um, I hope by the end of December, I'll have a package called scikit-bloom that sort of just implements this directly. Uh, that is something I'm currently working on. Um, but I do hope that you can kind of appreciate just some of the clever tricks that are happening here. 
But all of these tricks that I'm applying here have nothing to do with the algorithm. This is all kind of like turning text into some representation that an algorithm can then go ahead and use. Um, and that's also kind of like an interesting way of thinking about NLP, maybe. Like, maybe if I want to be very proficient at NLP, maybe I should think more about, like, what information I'm actually trying to encode and what problems might arise than that I actually think, like, oh, I'm just going to throw a transformer at it and worry about the GPU and have, have that solve everything for me. And it's actually a little bit more intuitive, I think, um, to at least start out with some simple tricks that are relatively lightweight. And again, this is a very neat hashing trick. Uh, I hope we can see more of this uh, in scikit-learn, which is why I'm also working on tools on the site sometimes, because I think these ideas are just very powerful. That said, um, you can do something else now. <laughs> um, so let's say we, we actually built this, right? Like we're using this hashing. So we're going to be doing this batching thing um, and we're going to be hashing. So um, constant vocabulary size, which is kind of nice. Um, and let's say you can also combine this with like the n-gram trick, right? So uh, instead of taking these words, you can also have like these subwords. Uh, that's also something that you can go ahead and use, right? So that's also pretty cool. But then there's also another thing that you could do. Let's once again consider uh, our data set X, right? That we might want to chunk into separate bits. I mean... I started this argument by saying, well, maybe it's super huge. Maybe that's like the reason why we want to split this up. But can we come up with another reason why maybe using this partial fitting feature, why that could be interesting? Like why, 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 why might we want to do something differently than fit predict? Why do we want to, is there another reason that we might want to like partial fit? And there's actually two pretty good ones. Uh, one of them is, um, let's say that I pre-train a model. So let's say I uh, I have some sort of a model that I trained not on IMDb, but on AWS. Like maybe there's some sentiment models for, uh, on Amazon data, let's say. Well, then I have a pre-trained model here, right? And you could say, well, just by feeding it our separate batches of data, um, I'm fine-tuning it. And even if it's a logistic regression, nothing is really stopping you from pre-training something giving that to someone else that they can then fine tune for their purpose. They can still be a very meaningful thing. And that's kind of interesting because now we have a pre-trained model without like heavy word embeddings. So, okay. I hope we agree. Like the partial fit thing kind of allows for this. That's kind of nice. Um, but theoretically, I could also just uh, give you a pre-trained model and we could call, and we could say those are the initialized weights. And from there, we're going to call dot fit and we might get something similar. Okay, sure. But there's another trick. Because what I can do here is every time I generate a new batch, I can also apply some augmentation. And if I think about spelling errors, hey, those are things that I can actually generate, right? Like if I want to generate spelling errors, I've got this keyboard over here uh, and I can kind of sample, well, sometimes when someone presses the H, uh, they, they accidentally uh, press the J button instead. And that means that whenever I have like a, a little subset of X, uh, what I can basically do is, let's say this is the first batch of X1. I can also just apply an augmentation function on that batch. And then when I do this, I can fine tune on like the actual data that I'm interested in, plus something that's just a little bit augmented. Uh, similar to in computer vision, how people like to rotate the image sometimes to sort of make it somewhat more robust. You can totally do that here as well. And lo and behold, if I do that, I can kind of loop over this, like, let's say 10 times. Then 10 times it is going to see the original data, but it's also going to see 10 different variants of spelling. And by doing this a lot, you can imagine, hey, we might be getting just a little bit more robustness out this way. BERT will not do that automatically for you, right? <laughs> and that's kind of the point that I'm also trying to drive home here. Um, a lot of these tricks are very sensible. They're definitely kind of old school. But they solve real-life problems that you cannot expect from a big uh, pre-trained model right away. But I do hope that you appreciate, like, with just a couple of these simple tricks, we actually get kind of far. Now, having said all that, um, I do want to make a bit of a pitch because I, I hope that people think, hey, these are, like, some interesting tricks. Um, if you're interested in having, like, a library that's pretty good at, like, making these, NL these augmentations on text, there's a library called NLP Aug that I recommend. Um, it has a lot of tricks, uh, but the main one that I like is just the, the keyboard augmentator. Uh, you can just say, hey, just uh, make spelling errors based on the keyboard. 
Um, and then you can say, well, uh, I don't care about uppercase. I don't care about numerics. Uh, and you can sort of generate this sort of thing. So that's something that you can totally use. Um, but I'm also in this domain to write some packages. And a while ago, I released a thing called uh, da, 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 uh, labs scikit partial. There you go. So uh, what you can do now is there's a package called uh, scikit partial that you can just go ahead and pip install. And what it implements is a pipeline uh, that can handle partial fit. So inside of scikit-learn, you can have a pipeline with .fit later, uh, but it doesn't generally implement partial fit because scikit-learn cannot guarantee that all the methods that are fed there actually are compatible with that API. However, um, I use this. I use these tricks all the time, so I figured I'd just write a package. If you want to use a pipeline that supports the partial fit API, um, you just have to feed it components like the uh, uh, hashed vectorization uh, with uh, the stochastic gradient descent classifier. Uh, these models have like a fit predict API, but also a partial fit predict API. Um, but this library basically allows you to just very quickly make a pipeline um, such that you can do stuff like this, where uh, you can do a whole bunch of data augmentation in the loop. Um, so if that's a, if that sounds interesting, um, scikit partial is like one of these tools I wrote to kind of make this easier. Um, the one I would say kind of flaw right now is that um, you have to use the hashing factorizer from scikit-learn that just hashes the thing once. Um, I am working on a tool that can sort of hash the thing n times to, to make it a bit more robust. Um, but yeah, if that sounds interesting, definitely check that package out. Um, so uh, a couple of people are sending in some messages now. So uh, I think this might be a good time to start answering some questions, but I hope this first half hour of improv uh, was interesting. Um, what I'm going to do now is just uh, loop over all the questions one by one. But if you have a question, that would be like a, a great time to ask. Um, also, by the way, um, if you're wondering like, hey, that bloom embedding, the, the bloom trick that I just mentioned, that's actually kind of cool. Um, if you go to the uh, Explosion AI website, we have a blog um, where we actually kind of go into more details on how this Bloom trick works uh, with like code examples and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, but before diving into that, let's just answer some questions first, maybe. Um, so it seems that some people are wondering about the notebook, if that will get shared. Um, uh, sure, uh, there are places where this is already hosted. Um, I'll be in email contact with the meetup uh, organizers to make sure that at the end, uh, all the links will be uh, available. Um, and then uh, Mark is asking uh, about the partial fit function, maybe a new question, but isn't the operating system taking care of the problem? Uh, all data doesn't fit in memory using virtual memory. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, it's more of a Python implementation thing than an operating system thing, because at some point, uh, you know, you can have a data set that just doesn't fit in memory. It has to remain on disk. Um, and I think in Python, I don't know if you actually can access the virtual memory, but I don't think that scikit-learn actually does that. Um, I could be wrong because I'm a little bit more of an applied mathematician person than a compiler person. Um, but yeah, I, do, I believe there's a, like a hard memory constraint there. Um, then the next question is like, in what specific case this function is really useful? Uh, I uh, Some fine tuning stuff I like to use it for. And I also really like to use it for um, like if it doesn't fit in memory, like those are the two main avenues of thought. Um, another thing that I also kind of like is that the hashing can be just somewhat more lightweight if you think about it. So uh, we hash stuff and then we know that we have a vector that's no longer than 20,000, let's say. Um, okay, then the logistic regression that follows only needs to train 20,000 weights. If we use a count factorizer model, it might be a million. Okay, the logistic regression is going to be way slower as well. Uh, so that's also a reason why you want to maybe use a hashing trick, which then also might be a good reason to use the partial fit API. Um, I think that's all the questions. I just want to make sure that uh, we have some time for people to ask more. Okay. Um, because then I want to maybe uh, close off this topic with like some advanced uh, notes, maybe. Uh, so sketchbook. Um, so the tricks that I just mentioned, right? Um, you can also find them in word embeddings, curious enough. So um, 
let's consider that i don't know yeah let's let's draw it out that way uh, let's say i have a neural network um so i've got stuff going in here like some sort of vector uh and then you know uh, some other feed forward layers are happening here let's say and i'm kind of i'll be a bit hand wavy about this right and but at some point at the end here uh, we have something that we're interested in predicting um what could happen is then uh we have training data and then whatever errors we are making here uh, they're going to cause like a gradient update uh, to propagate backward uh, and that's how weights typically get updated inside of a neural network, right? Like that's a pattern I think uh, many of us have seen before. Well, then one thing that you could do, right, is you could say, well, let's say the input here is a sentence, something like uh, my dog uh, is uh, great. I don't know, let's say some sort of sentence. One thing we could do is we could say, well, let's pretend that uh, the word great is missing. That's masked, so to say. And then the sentence is the input and the missing word is a thing that I'm going to be trying to predict. And then maybe the output over here is also like a sparse array, right? Like uh, that can also be the output of a neural network. Um, then as a kind of a bonus, what you kind of get is that some intermediate representation in this, uh, in this neural network um, can also be seen as a way to take a document and to represent that numerically somehow. It's just that in this case, the representation is not going to be a sparse array, but it's probably going to be like a dense one, so like 0 0.1 minus 0 0.5, like floating point numbers instead. And a lot of people kind of like that because they say, oh, this is a pre-trained way of, of generating all of these weights. But if I think about like all the issues I mentioned before, like the spelling error stuff, um, you kind of wonder, well, we kind of have the same issue maybe in word embedding land, right? Uh, because also here, if I have like a spelling error maybe, and I use a count vectorizer trick as input, uh, you, you kind of hit the same issue. So the, the fun thing is, uh, if I think about the count vectorizer trick, Uh, the trick where I use the n-grams, right? And the and the character representation. If I take the same neural network, but instead of using a count vectorizer, I use a count vectorizer with the n-gram trick, uh, then you get word embeddings uh, from fast text. Uh, like the whole trick inside of fast text, hand wavy, um, is uh, using character uh, representations as input uh, for the learning algorithm. Um, that's the main difference between like doing something in Gensim and doing something in fast text. And if you're interested in the hashing trick that I just showed you, well, what you can also do is take the count vectorizer from fast text, uh, hash that uh, three times, and then you end up with a sparse array. And when you put that in, uh, then you get the bloom embeddings, um, uh, the, which is stuff that Spacey has been working on. Uh, so some of our fancy word embeddings are really a similar algorithm as what you're used to before. It's just that we hash it three times beforehand. That's the entire trick. So also like in somewhat more advanced and reasoned things that people are doing, um, you know, there's, there's no real need to go deep on a GPU yet. Uh, a lot of the, the cleverness really comes from these feature tricks instead. Um, okay, so at this point in time, I, I like to think that this is like a nice little chapter that's come to a close. It's just that I'm looking at like a Zoom screen and I have no idea <laughs> like what the energy is of the crowd. Um, so just to get a bit of a confirmation, uh, I hope this was interesting, but how's the energy? Uh, do we have some sort of way to gauge that? Yeah, we have that. We, yeah, we, 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 it's actually much more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm curious what you thought it was going to be, but... Uh, no, because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really into NLP in, oh, in, okay. in a sense. So like, that's why I jumped in. And then now that I'm looking at it, I'm like, oh, NLP actually has some kind of cool tricks, you know? Yeah, okay. Uh, happy to hear. Um, uh, I do see like a pretty good question coming in, actually. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm going to handle that. And if other people have more questions, like now is the time to ask, because I will be moving on to a different topic. Uh, but someone uh, saying like, sorry for backing up a bit, but could you elaborate on spelling errors? Uh, why wouldn't the BERT model hand handle spelling errors by naturally running into them uh, while they're training and fine tuning? Thank you. So great question. Um, a couple of things about BERT models. Um, so BERT models, right, um, they also have some sort of a tokenizer. 
you still need some way to turn text um, into uh, separate tokens, uh, which in turn um, uh, usually resemble some sort of a sparse array uh, before Bert does the clever transformer bits uh, that follow after. Now, classic BERT, the stuff that's pre-trained typically, also comes with a static tokenizer. Um, the tokenizer does some clever stuff, by the way. Um, so if you have a word like geology or a geologist or a geometry, um, you can kind of look at these words. You can kind of say, well, maybe this geo bit uh, that could be its own token because that appears frequently enough in the language and it also encodes meaning of a word in a way. Uh, and if I think of a, you know, uh, ologist, that can also be a separate metry. Yeah, okay. So there is maybe a compression trick that I can do such that I end up with these subwords that aren't exactly moving windows across all the characters that I see. Um, but that can be something clever. And that's in a nutshell what uh, the BERT tokenizer does. There's a couple of variants of this idea. Uh, but this is basically it. It's just a very clever compression trick uh, to come up with these subtokens. But unfortunately, that also, yeah, so that that that's the word piece tokenizer. Like word piece does something. Um, like there's word piece and there's also the byte pair one, and there's some modest differences between the two. Uh, but the end result is basically this idea that we just come up with clever subwords that appear relatively frequently, um, but that we don't have a huge vocabulary either. Um, I have a a Raza video I made a year ago that explains this in more detail. So having said that, uh, you are somewhat robust against spelling errors. Let's be honest about that. So if I write down G all low uh, G like this, um, then this first part, you know, that, that part of the token is still going in that can still get encoded. So, you know, you're kind of safe there. The only downside is that if someone really messes up <laughs> and writes down G, uh, uh, you know, I, I am stretching the argument here because, you know, this is becoming a somewhat less probable spelling error by doing this. But theoretically, at least, I can still kind of argue, hey, this learning procedure, if I take the pre-trained tokenizer, um, it still cannot deal with new tokens uh, as it sees new data. It's still, a set to uh, it's still a set amount of tokens that it know knows up front and it cannot really add new ones. If I then step back and say, hey, let's use the hashing trick there, then it is able to learn from new tokens coming in. Um, hopefully you've done something with the Bloom trick such that uh, collisions are handled right. But theoretically, at least, I can still argue that there's still merit to the hashing tricks I mentioned before. Uh, I hope that answered uh, the question. A bit of a bit of a deep dive there. But um, BERT models have some really cool properties. Uh, there's definitely use cases for them. Um, but pre-trained ones still come with a, a set tokenizer, um, which in turn also means that if you're really, really worried about spelling errors, that might be really, really unique. Uh, theoretically, um, uh, you might still want to be a bit fluid uh, in your tokenizer as well. Uh, uh, an area where this kind of comes up a lot is also where, like, uh, suppose, for example, you've trained your BERT model on, like, Wikipedia data, which has, like, immaculate spelling, <laughs> and then you want to apply that to Twitter. You should still expect stuff to go wrong there because of spelling. Um, and also, some of the, to be honest, like some of the spacey models also suffer from this. Uh, most of the spacey models are trained on news data, um, especially like the named entity recognition stuff, I think, was trained on that. And you can kind of smell from a distance there that like text that's unlike news data, let's say with lots of spelling errors or um, weird use of emojis and stuff, uh, is just going to uh, be tricky to really deal with. Uh, but, but you are right in the sense that like, you know, uh, BERT models, they're not they're not silly. Like they do have some robustness against spelling errors. It's just that uh it is still a set uh, set tokenizer. Um how do you deal with augmentation in short words that can potentially uh change the uh, change the meaning? Yeah, that that's the downside. Uh, very that's a great question. Um so someone is just asking, like, hey, this is a sounds like a cool trick, right? Data augmentation, pretty cool. Um, but there are these awkward scenarios where uh let's say What's a good one? Um, um, uh, do, 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 on or no? I don't know. This is like a very like a swap of characters. And yes, the word on is different from the word no. And if you then sort of say, "Hey, I'm doing data augmentation," um, aren't I giving the algorithm like uh, bad examples because uh, I'm changing the meaning of the word? 
Um, and you're completely right. Like that is a downside. Um, you could potentially argue, hey, if you're doing this, it's just more noise and you're becoming robust against noise, right? Um, but you are right in the sense that uh, you can also overdo the augmentation. Um, if I'm not mistaken, though, in the library that I'm using, typically, uh, let's go back to that one. Um, NLP Aug, if I'm not mistaken, has a bunch of settings. And I think you can do stuff like, um, hey, only do this many augmentations. Don't go overboard. Keep the augmentations contained. Uh, there are some things you could do in that realm. Um, but you are right. You can definitely overdo it uh, with uh, augmentation as well. Um, another area to kind of be mindful of is I think in NLP Aug, there's also like, um, you can you can choose to change the characters, but you can also change the entire word, right? Um, that's also kind of tricky because then it might use like word embeddings to like swap out words. And also there, there's a risk that you're swapping it with a word that has a completely different meaning. Um, I think in general, like augmenting a photo is just a little bit more straightforward because you know for sure if it's slightly rotated, it's still a picture of a cat. And it's really hard to do that with text. Uh, so there are all of these tricks, um, but it does, it's good to remind ourselves that they're just that. They're just tricks. They might help you. Uh, I think tricks are really cool, but you should obviously always try and see if it actually works. Um, I think that's the best advice in that realm. Um, someone else is asking, uh, is there no way to combine embeddings, uh, the one trained on news data and that of Twitter data? I mean, there is like the, the blunt way to do it. Um, I'm about to show you a trick or an implementation that actually does that. Um, so you could say, hey, um, just like here, I've got like two count vectorizers. Uh, what if I, I have text and then uh, I want to pass that to like a word embedding vectorizer and I have one trained on Twitter and I have another one uh, trained on Wikipedia? Yeah, okay, uh, let's concatenate them <laughs> together. Uh, so let's say uh, this word embedding has length 300, this word embedding has length 300, then concatenate them together. You've got a word embedding of length 600. Past that logistic regression, you can totally do that. Um, are you going to incur extra overhead and will this really matter? Don't know. Depends on your use case. Uh, I'm kind of wondering what kind of data set you might have where you need to combine the knowledge from Wikipedia and Twitter. <laughs> like. I'm kind of wondering, like, what use case might that be? Um, but again, this, this definitely falls in the realm of nothing is stopping you. If you can write it in Python, you can at least try. Um, it might not be the simplest thing to do, but nothing is stopping you. Let me just put it that way. Any final questions on this topic? Because if not, uh, what I think I want to do now is just introduce, like, a five-minute break so I can get a glass of water and, like, other people can also just uh, grab something. Um, and then uh, I'll be back in like a few minutes, uh, and then I'll give you like a the next demo, which which is more about word embeddings and language models. But I hope that this was interesting. Um, by the way, in this five, I'll be back earlier. But if people have questions, now is a great time to ask as well. Uh, I hope people are having fun. Oh, more questions are being asked. Um, so I, I won't start on the next segment just yet, but because people are asking questions. Um, someone is asking, how would you go about aggregating the per word token embeddings for an entire sequence? Uh, great question. Most people just take the average, uh, which is not a great representation of a sentence, but I'm going to talk about that next uh, bit. Um, and someone is saying, hey, that three times hashing property is data set dependent or is 3x. Um, it's definitely not set. You can definitely play around with it. Um, I think Spacey uses two, but I could be wrong. Um, I will say like it kind of depends on if you have a smaller vocabulary, you probably want to hash it more often. But you also don't want to have a tiny vocabulary either <laughs> because that increases the hash collision chance. Um, if you go to the Spacey, am I sharing the screen now? No. Uh, am I doing it now? I think so, right? No. Yeah. Okay. So if you're interested in this, um, I, I think, I guess one of the coolest tricks I've learned uh, a while ago, but if you go to this blog post called uh, the, the compact word vectors with bloom embeddings one, um, this goes into more depth on like how, um, we fit one mil is like how we do our word embeddings. We kind of use this, this hashing trick, so to say, 
Um, but at the bottom, like we explain how this whole thing works. But if you go to the bottom, like we have some Python code. Uh, but there's also a, a collab notebook that we share, this one, uh, where you know we kind of go through some of the code in the in the in the blog post. But at the bottom, you can actually kind of play a game uh, that sort of says, "Hey, what's the vocabulary size? How often do we hash it? How much information is actually saved?" Uh, so if you want to maybe play around with that, uh, this would be the blog post to check. Um, also know that the this blog post is the one about bloom embeddings. Uh, there's also one about Floret, which is like a very basically the same trick, but like for word embeddings in a Python package. Um, definitely check that out as well. Uh, I am one of the authors of this blog post, by the way. Um, but if you're interested in these kinds of tricks and also like, hey, how are they used inside of Spacey? Uh, this is uh, the source. Uh, this is the place where you want to read this. And also just in general, there's like lots of cool stuff here. Um, Spancat, if you haven't seen that, it's like a really cool... How do we find substrings in a sentence that we're interested in? So for example, uh, I want to detect all the banks and uh, possibly the country in the bank. So like Bank of America, I want to detect uh, every reference to a bank in a country and I want the country uh, inside of the uh, bank name detected as well. Um, how do you do that? Spancat is a trick uh, that you can use for it. Um, but the, in general, this is, uh, I'm biased, but this is one of the better blogs out there if you're interested in NLP. Uh, the chat window, because I think two more people had questions. Uh, oh, link to blogs. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, has it been five minutes, you think? Yeah, I think so. Ah, okay, well, approximately then. Let's uh, good, good enough to get started again. Okay, um, so uh, let's now go back, uh, back to a bit of theory. What I'm about to do is a, a bit of a hand wavy argument, so forgive me for that, but um. But something that's like kind of general about embeddings. It's the most general thing that I could come up with. Um, let's say that I have some sort of text on a big corpus, Amazon sentiment, whatever. Uh, I mean, what I could do is like do the neural network thing. Um, I have some sort of input space and I have a couple of these dense layers. And then I have like this task at the end that I'm interested in. Um, and as I kind of discussed before, you know, uh, it's all feed forward stuff. All that stuff is nice. Uh, and maybe like the intermediate layer here is kind of a nice little embedding that I could go ahead and use. Okay, so far so good. What some people do though, which I think is pretty interesting, is they say, well, let's not just do one task, let's do many. So there's not just one thing that they're training on, there's actually many tasks that they're training on. And theoretically, of course, you know, nothing is stopping you because uh, you're just going to get more uh, gradient feedbacks. But one thing that is kind of interesting when you do this is that you do end up with like a um, embedding over here that's been trained on multiple things. So we, like, if, if you do this right, you might be able to encode more of language in here. So let's say that we have a sentiment task over here. Um, let's say that we have like a, a, a newspaper um, classification task over here, right? then, okay, uh, do this right. And you might end up with an embedding that has like something of news topic and something of sentiment, uh, you know, in, in one go here. Um, and like, I have to be a bit hand wavy here because there's just so many like architecture, like neural network architectures that you could use for this. Uh, you've got the transformer, which is definitely kind of hip. Um, but there's also like the universal sentence encoder from Google. Uh, it, that one, depending on the setting, is just a very, very deep feed forward network basically is a deep averaging network is what they call it um but but whatever you do i mean what i do want to emphasize here is that it can still be useful to use these pre-trained language models so to say uh, and i'm not so much interested in word embeddings anymore i'm a little bit more interested in hey just text goes in all the text gets tokenized and encoded and i go from text to a vector 
so I can n-dimensional array. And from here, you know, I could put my logistic regression, uh, like definitely something I can do. The, the only awkward thing is that like, okay, but then this one implementation uses TensorFlow, this other implementation uses PyTorch. And what I kind of want is just, you know, to use my trusty scikit-learn pipelines again. Like I'm not necessarily interested in like re-implementing a paper. I'm just a little bit more interested in, hey, can I just try out this model, please? That'd be just kind of nice. Now, um, back when I worked at Raza, I was working on a project called What Lies. Um, and this uh, was a somewhat popular uh, machine learning library. And the whole point of this library is that uh, it could visualize word embeddings for you. It's like the, the main purpose of this library was to do just this. Um, but uh, it also had a feature where uh, you can say, hey, um, here are word embeddings, like byte pair word embeddings, so to say. Uh, give me the English ones. And then I have a scikit-learn pipeline with a transformer component in it. And this is kind of like the confactorizer, but instead it's just going to average all the word embeddings from the sentence that it receives. So th this was kind of popular. It was definitely kind of cool. But I got to say, in practice, you rarely deal with words. You are, especially if you're doing classification, you are typically more interested in sentences, at least. Um, if you're doing named entity recognition, it's, of course, different, but it's a slightly more advanced topic for now. Um, but I kind of figured, you know, what lies is kind of nice because it just implements all of them. But then very practically, I figured, well, let's just take the ones that deal with sentences, because I think most of the time people will be interested in that. Um, so what I did is I wrote a little library for embeddings um, that I like to call embedder. Um, bit of a pun there. Uh, but the whole point of this library is that you're able to say, well, look, um, here's a sentence encoder. Here is a name of a sentence encoder, which you can look up online, just a bunch of strings. And uh, then this pipeline is just going to represent the pre-trained language model. And you can just put a logistic regression behind that, if you wish. Um, so what I would like to do now is just demo this real quick, uh, just so people can kind of see uh, that this just does kind of works and some of the tricks that you could do with it. Um, so I am loading up some tools that are somewhat heavyweight, but um, uh, here you can see I am using uh, Embetter. Uh, so from embetter.txt, uh, give me the sentence encoder. Uh, and I'm also using a column grabber. Uh, and the column grabber just takes like a column from a data frame. Uh, this way, I just know I have a list of texts uh, that I'm passing through. Um, and what I can do is I can do something like, uh, here's a data frame uh, with some text. And I can say, hey, uh, fit transform that data frame. Um, did I make a typo there? Uh, that ought to work, shouldn't it? Did I make a typo? I think I made a typo. Uh, do, 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 do. Cannot find the typo. Oh, but the code is here, sorry. Um, um, what I wanted to show is below here. Um, so here I'm saying take that text embedding pipeline uh, and I'm giving it a data frame. The data frame looks like this. Um, it has text and it has like a label column, something I'm interested in predicting. And you can see that uh, I'm just passing into this text and out comes this big numeric array. Uh, I can check the shape of this array. Um, there are two items in this array and uh, the embedding is of size 384. Uh, this is a pre-trained language model. Uh, I don't want to go too much into the details of what it exactly does. The main thing I hope that you are interested in for now um, is that, hey, just a scikit-learn component that I could go ahead and use. And also, this is a, a size that's relatively comfortable for logistic regression uh, or like whatever classifier that I'm using. But uh, we can kind of do some fun stuff with this now too, right? So. Uh, just a trick, you know, just a trick. I'll be assuming that the sentence encoder does something that's relatively clever. Um, and I'm assuming that it's been trained on some interesting tasks such that similar texts appear close together in embedded space, so to say. Well, what's kind of happening here, and what I could do at least, 
in like let's say this is like a super high dimensional space and then i have an embedding here for the sentence uh, uh this is great and i can have another embedding uh, maybe somewhere over here that's uh this uh sucks like obviously i'm going for the positive sentiment on one end and the negative sentiment on another then suppose a new text comes in what i can do is embed it and then i can say let's suppose that this is the new embedded spot in the embedded space for the new text um this is amazing let's pretend that is the text well then hopefully at least the distance between this positive example is much smaller than the distance to that negative one, right? Uh, that's something you would expect or hope, if nothing else. But if that's something that we expect, then hang on, we can kind of build a zero shot, like, like a few shot classifier by just putting a K neighbors classifier at the end of the pipeline, <laughs> because that's what K neighbors does. And uh, just as a small demo, I, I, I just thought this was just kind of cute. Um, so this is great it's amazing that's a positive example uh i totally hate this is a negative example okay uh, that gets embedded um but then i have this quick shot pipeline that takes the embedding and then just does the k neighbors thing um and if i then give it the sentence that's just wonderful it predicts positive and oh no this is bad that predicts negative but the cool thing here is that uh, the word wonderful doesn't appear in the training data that I gave it here at all. So I'm really just leveraging uh, the pre-trained model as much as possible. And this is just kind of nice because it's just very easy to come up with like a, a semi-reasonable classifier with only a little bit of effort. Um, some people like to call this few-shot learning. You can almost call it zero-shot learning as well. Uh, the idea basically is like, hey, um, with just very few examples, but a pre-trained model, uh, how far can we get? Um, well, uh, quite far. And uh, if you use Embedder, uh, it's just a single line of code almost, which I think is just a really neat sort of API trick, something that I find uh, to be quite pragmatic. Um, now, one thing uh, that I do want to mention, um, so nothing is stopping you from using this uh, sentence encoder uh, next to a count vectorizer, right? So if you're using super rare words that you do want to just fit predict on, uh, you can still have like, embeddings and count vectors next to each other uh, might actually be a good idea. Nothing is stopping you from doing that. Uh, another thing I also want to mention is that um, the embedder tools all support the partial fit API uh, because, you know, I'm, I don't have to learn anything from the text. Everything's just static and pre-trained. So uh, you can totally use that in partial fit pipelines as well. Um, but this is a cool trick. Uh, and from here, you can kind of say, well, what else can you use this for? Because, you know, we have easy embeddings at our disposal at this point, right? That's kind of nice. So how about a new trick? So um, as some of you might know, um, Explosion uh, makes a couple of tools. And one of the tools that we make is called Prodigy, um, which is this annotation tool. Uh, I see people uh, share the What Lies library, by the way. Uh, definitely feel free to use What Lies. Um, but if you're interested in doing something pragmatic with uh, like language models, what lies is more word embeddings uh, and better is a little bit more uh, general embeddings. Uh, note that embedder also supports images, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, what lies doesn't. What lies is only just words. Um, anyway, uh, I do want to mention this uh, product for a bit because Prodigy is, you know, that's the kind of thing we make money with, but it is also a data annotation tool. Um, which is super important because not a whole lot of people uh, take care in the training data much. Um, so one thing that you're able to do inside of Prodigy is you can just use shortcuts and stuff to uh, quickly annotate data. And it's a, like, it's a Python wheel, so you can customize it with Python code as well. But if I think about the act of labeling, right? Like let's, let's pretend that we just have this new data set and we want to start annotating it. Um, it might take a while to get started. Um, so is this about artificial intelligence attending to the needs of the too busy? Uh, no. Can green make green? No, it doesn't sound like artificial intelligence. What it means to be a dad? No. Okay. So 
you can annotate, you can uh, you can get your training data this way. That's great. But I'm kind of wondering, can I maybe use embeddings to make it easier for me to annotate my data? Because we just saw this really cool trick, right? Where we're just able to say like, hey, just find me stuff that's similar to this one sentence. So, and I can kind of imagine, hey, if I know like there's a rare class in my training data and I want to get more examples of those, hey, we might be able to use embeddings for that. That'd be kind of nice. That'd be kind of interesting. So uh, I came up with this uh, trick. Uh, I don't want to suggest it's super unique or anything, but it is, I think, a cool trick. Um, and the trick is something I like to call bulk labeling. And it's basically a user interface on top of these embeddings that are meant to help you get started with annotating, which is something that we care about and that's super important we get right. The way it works is you take your text and you just pass that through whatever language model you like. Uh, pick a reasonable one, um, but we have a way to get from text to like an n-dimensional array. For each one text example, I have an array of n numbers. So, you know, that's great, uh, but n numbers are kind of hard to visualize and to grasp because there's just so many dimensions. But we've got tools at our disposal, like PCA and UMAP, that allows us to turn that into a two-dimensional array. Oh, and two-dimensional arrays are great because two-dimensional arrays, you can totally plot those. And when you do that, like, what should we expect is a good question, right? So if there really are patterns in my text and if there really are similarities, you would kind of expect that the scatter chart would have like clusters at some point, right? And then hopefully like a single cluster, you can kind of select that and then you should be able to say, like, very quickly be able to verify, like, oh, that's about a certain topic. So uh, I made a Python library meant to be used with Embedder called Balk. Um, well, people are playing with fireworks in my neighborhood. Um, but uh, you can pip install Balk, and Balk actually gives you this interface that you see over here. Um, so what I would like to do now is just give you a very quick demo of that, uh, just to convince you that it's actually kind of uh, we can use machine learning algorithms for more than just making predictions. We can also actually use them to uh, build interactive uh, labeling tools as well. Um, so let's go to Visual Studio Code. Uh, I have a window on this screen. I'll just bring it in here. There we go. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open up this file over here. Um, it's got a bunch of Twitter texts uh, that I collected a while ago it's from customer service, I think. Um, and what you're looking at here is like, this is the text. Let's zoom in a bit. There's text and there's like a X and a Y coordinate. It's just a CSV file with three columns in that sense. And it's these coordinates that I'm going to chart. Um, but each one of those coordinates corresponds with like this one sentence from a language model. Um, so what I can do is I can say bulk, uh, and I'm interested in doing bulk text, uh, and I'm interested in doing it on this uh, clue star that's CSV file. And then this just opened up. Um, and this, what you see over here, like this is the uh, clustered interface that I mentioned. And the way this, this works, um, you can just make a quick selection here, and then the text over here updates. So you're able to very quickly see like, hey, uh, what is this about? So I selected a cluster over here. Uh, Christmas, Xmas, uh, Christmas, 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 Xmas. Okay, so I think we know what this cluster is about. Uh, what I could go ahead and do now is I can say, well, if that's a cluster of interest, uh, I can just say Christmas.csv. Uh, and now locally, a Christmas.csv file has appeared uh, with just this one selection that I've made over here. And, you know, uh, this is by no means a perfect labeling. Like, there's probably some label errors in this thing. But what I can do now is I can take my labeling tool, like Prodigy or whatever, um, and now I can just very quickly go through all of them saying, yes, no, it's about Christmas. I don't have to go through the entire big blob of data that you see here. I can just focus on the part that likely has a lot of Christmas uh, questions, so to say. And another kind of what I think is a cool demo um, is you can also uh, add some colors. So uh, I'm going to run the same command now, uh, but now I'm going to give it this keywords argument uh, just so some of the keywords uh, will appear with color. 
So uh, same chart as before. It's just that uh, a couple of colors have just appeared. So here is apparently a cluster with stuff about the website. It's the orange area. I've got some stuff that's green over here. That's all about delivery. And I've got some red stuff over here. That's all about a club card. Um, and again, um, I hope that we can kind of appreciate like, hey, yeah, having these pre-trained language models around is not just great for predictive stuff. Um, it's also great for like doing topic discovery and this interactive way of understanding your data better. Um, and what I think is kind of cute about this, like um, this is not necessarily just machine learning. It's also human learning. Um, I'm also getting an impression of what's actually in this data set. And it's kind of an impression of what does the language model believe and what is actually in my data um, that I can try to sort of um, try and understand here. Um, one demo of this is actually just kind of cute. Um, so this is the delivery cluster, right? But there's like, uh, I can kind of zoom in. There's some green points, but there's also some blue ones in here. So that means that there are some sentences here where the word delivery does not appear but the word order does. And then you can kind of wonder, well, if there's a complaint about the delivery, you can also say, hey, my order never arrived or my driver never arrived. And you can also kind of see here that it actually goes beyond just matching on a string as well, which I think is also pretty interesting. Um, one aspect of this language model is that it should be able to maybe understand that certain words have a similar meaning. I mean, understand and meaning it's, it's it's not a sentient model or anything like that but i mean you do hope that similar sentences are similar um and it also means that it will go beyond uh like string matching which i think is also quite powerful because you don't want to have a model that overfits on a single word um anyway so that's i think a pretty neat trick but we can go a step further <laughs> um this, like something else that we could still do because uh, why would we stop at text? Um, you can also do this with images, right? Um, for images, you also have this idea of, hey, um, instead of text uh, going in, you can have an image, maybe have that go through a convolutional model. Uh, that too will give you like an n-dimensional embedding. Um, and again, you can use the UMAP trick to turn that into a two-dimensional embedding. There is a thing we can do, though. So, um, yeah, let's let's. I, I, I kind of want to wrap up because otherwise it's going to get uh, quite late, and I do want to have time for questions. Um, but I'll just uh, do the first demo real quick. Uh, I'm just going to show you what it looks like to use bulk on the pets data set. Um, so, slightly different data set, less data points, but again, I can kind of make a selection here, uh, and instead of seeing text here, you can see these uh, images pop up, so to say. Uh, and I have a bunch of images of a bunch of pets and they're going through the exception model, UMAP, all of that. And then I kind of see this one corner over here where uh, kind of Chihuahua dogs. And if I go to the bottom over here, it's all a specific kind of cat, right? I mean, so far so good. Um, and, you know, there's some clusters in here, but there's also like regions where uh, cats and dogs are kind of mixed together. Um, and... If I think about like language models versus like image image models and stuff, um, I can imagine that like a image detection model, if I think about the features that it's learned, right? I can definitely imagine that like maybe it learned about the shape of the ear of the animal. So like if this was a dog, let's say, right? A happy dog. Dogs kind of sometimes have these fluffy ears and maybe cats have a little bit more pointy ears, but there are also dogs with pointy ears. So that's great. I'm still able to make some selection that's kind of interesting. But the thing that is also kind of hard here is that I'm not necessarily sure what all these separate clusters mean. And I cannot use the keywords trick that I just had before uh, because that uh, pixels, uh, it's way too tricky. But I can use another trick. Uh, what I can do is I can say, well, I have a system that accepts an image. And then I have some sort of convolutional model, right? Like a very big one. And then... Um, Hopefully it was trained on lots of different classes, but I have this embedding at the end here that I'm kind of U mapping here. What I could do is I could say, well, let's train our own task head on top of that. And the way that that just kind of works, um, like this is an array, so to say, right? And what I could do is just say, let's put a hidden layer here, like a final output layer here. 
and just feed forward neural network stuff. Then what I could do is I can say, well, let's say I just annotate like 20 images of like cats and dogs. And let's say I'm interested in building a cat dog classifier. Well, then what I can do is I can say, well, just on those like 20 images, um, let's just start training. Let's update the weights, but let's only update the weights up until the convolutional model. Like the idea here is like when I'm training it this way, um, everything that happened in the pre-trained layer, that's frozen. Like I'm not changing any of the weights of like the, the pre-trained model, but I am changing the weights of this new task head on top. And the thinking here is that if I were to do this, then maybe this embedding over here, like the, the output of that dense array, maybe that combines the class that I'm interested in with the knowledge from this convolutional model. And maybe that's a more interesting embedding. It's kind of the hypothesis that I'm thinking of here. And, and to demo that way of thinking, I, I kind of just want to show two things. Like one thing I want to show real quick is that it's pretty easy to just uh, annotate 50 images. I mean, um, I'm starting up the Prodigy server here. Um, is this a cat? Uh, no, 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 yes, no, yes. No, uh, yes and no. Uh, this took about 10 seconds and I've got 10 images. So like getting to 50 is like maybe a minute, let's say. But as a demo, I've actually um, done this fine tuning trick uh, up front. Um, so what I've done is I've created this one little Keras model over here. Um, the way that this model works uh, is it basically outputs uh, two models. I've got the uh, first model over here that takes this inputs and outputs, um, which is a Keras input with like the final dense layer at the end. But I've, I've also got this intermediate representation, right? So I've got like inputs, then this layer X, and then this layer uh, outputs that is inside of that function. And the thinking is that um, I have this internal model which I'm calling the embedding model. And then I've got this model on the outside that I'm calling the actual prediction model. And if I then tell Keras to go ahead and train the prediction model, then I also get the embedding model for free and I can just pluck that out. Uh, this kind of the, the code that's running here is basically just doing this. Um, this notebook is out there, so I'm definitely gonna share you the link. Um, training this took like less than a couple of seconds. But the main really cool, cool thing here is that when I did this, um, here's what the UMAP space looked like uh, before. So like with no extra tricks. And uh, here's what it looked like after I did the fine tuning. And, you know, if, if you squint your eyes a bit, okay, for sure, like step one, shape is different, right? So something happened, that's, that's step one. But step two is, I can kind of see a line here. Maybe all the dogs are on this end, all the cats are on this one, and the stuff in the middle here is the stuff it's unsure about. And if I think about what's happening, that would actually kind of make a bit of sense, right? Because I'm actually saying like, hey, there's a cat dog thing that uh, I think is the most important thing for you to learn. So, there should be like a separating line in this space that splits it. So let's have a look. So um, this is the space. I'm just gonna make a selection on top here. Yeah, all cats. I'm gonna make a selection at the bottom here. Definitely all dogs. And if I make a selection in the middle here, it's a bit of a mix. And also if I'm honest, um, these Pomerian dogs, if I look at the ears, I, mean, I do kind of get that like, if I were to think of a cat-like dog, <laughs> um, no offense to any Pomerian owners, right? But I can kind of imagine that this kind of dog would fit that. And this is just so cool.
right? Um, I'm able to use these embeddings, some, some of these tricks that I'm able to use in language land, I'm also able to use in computer vision land. And again, I'm not really using a GPU. I'm more thinking about like, hey, what's the application? What's the trick that I can use? Can I use a hashing trick here, a visualization trick there? And I like to think that alone is making me way more productive than a GPU ever will make me instead. Um, and you know, this this has been a bit of a demo that's been kind of all over the place, right? Like been lecturing all, for almost two hours. Um, but I hope that after these demos, there's a thought in your head that sort of says like, yeah, maybe the more th maybe the thing I should worry about when I'm doing data science projects is more like, hey, what's what kind of tricks do I need here? And nine times out of ten, the tricks you need are domain knowledge and then just something simple. Um, and yeah, it helps to make some tools now and again, but you probably don't need a GPU all the time. And hopefully the tricks that I've shown you here help to convince you of that, that you're able to think of like way cooler things um, than, oh, I need to do like grid search on AutoML. Uh, there, there's definitely more uh, clever things that you can do than that. Um, all the stuff I've shown you so far, uh, like there's typically like a longer video that I've made on behalf of Explosion, like all the demos that, like half the demos, that the final bits that I just showed you. Uh, there are like full tutorials online on the Explosion YouTube. Uh, so give that a follow if you're inter interested in this stuff. Um, they also come with the notebooks uh, and all the code you need to run this yourself. Um, but yeah, uh, I've been talking for almost two hours. I can feel my throat being a bit sore. Uh, I hope this was interesting. Uh, and we have like a good chunk of time for questions at this point. So um, yeah, uh, ask away. And I see one heart emoji. Thank you. How, how do we want to do the questions, by the way? Do you want to open up the floor or do you want to do the, the chat thing? I guess anyone can ask the questions. Like yeah, so at, this, this, at this point, we can do it live, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, feel free to ask me about anything else that I didn't talk about. Like, if you have questions about Prodigy, Spacey, and stuff, I can also answer them. Uh, is it possible to use Bulk without the Prodigy license? Yes. Uh, Bulk is an open source project on my personal repo. Uh, you don't have to use Prodigy with it. Uh, I do recommend checking out Prodigy, but it's a paid product. If you don't check it out, I don't blame you. Uh, Prodigy, uh, Bulk is open source. It is meant to be used together with Prodigy, though, but uh, you don't have to. Either. One thing that might be cool, actually, to mention, uh, if you are interested in a labeling tool, um, and let's say, like, if you're interested, uh, Prodigy, I will say, is like, hey, you have multiple users, you want keyboard shortcuts, um, you know, proper tool. But if you want something that's really quick and dirty, um, there's a tool called uh, Jupyter Pigeon, I think. Yeah. Uh, pip install pigeon Jupyter. Um, and basically it just gives you a, like a very lightweight annotation interface inside of a Jupyter notebook. Um, no keyboard shortcuts or anything like that, but you are able to sort of say, uh, yes, no, click, click. Um, and bulk you can definitely use together with this. So if you're looking for something super basic, uh, this might also just go ahead and cut it. Check out Prodigy though. Like <laughs> I work for this company. You gotta check, like, <laughs> check it out, but, uh. I think it's also worth mentioning that they check the Calm code, the resource itself. I really enjoy it. I want to kind of give props to it while we are here. And yeah, um, really great website. Uh, thanks. Yeah, uh, I almost yeah. So I also host this data set, this, this data web, data learning resource. Um, if you're interested, by the way, um, if I can recommend anything on this website right now, check out the challenge. Uh, people have been having a lot of fun with this. Uh, so there's a programming challenge here that's a bit unlike the other programming challenges. Um, every puzzle requires you to find the hidden message. Uh, and if you want to explore Calm Code, there's videos and tutorials, etc. Uh, uh, it's all free. Um, but uh, the challenges thing here is something I've been getting a lot of, a lot of cool reviews for. So um, check them out. Right. Yeah. But this is the this, is the this yeah. is the interesting thing of like uh, Zoom calls. <laughs> it's like not so. It's a remote thing. It's kind of nice because people can tune in from wherever. But you do get this awkward silence at the end, right? <laughs> um, 
and I can also imagine that people are just tired. So uh, if you've been having fun here, uh, also feel free to log off. I won't blame you. Uh, but if you have any questions like about anything, uh, this is the time to ask. And you can also type that if, uh, if it's easier for you. I want to encourage people to ask questions, but I also just want to tell you that we're literally getting live positive feedback. So people are writing to me. This is really cool. Thank you. So yeah. Oh, just, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> people are definitely enjoying it. Oh, because people can tune in on YouTube as well. No, people from the um, we're gonna upload it later, but uh, just people from the from the meeting. Uh, oh. I see a fun question. So uh, what's your personal motivation to do all the great open source work? Um, I have a problem and I try to solve it. <laughs> like it's like it's a, it's um, I don't write open source stuff uh, for other people to use. I primarily write it for myself. Um, the, the easiest way to kind of explain it is at some point I've noticed, hey, I'm reusing the same code across multiple notebooks and I hate copying and pasting code. So then I think, okay, it should be a package. Um, and what I do try to do like, um, I used to be kind of young and I kind of figured, you know, oh, any open source, any tool that I put out there needs to be on PyPI. I, I have stopped doing that um, because, you know, if you put it up a PyPI, people expect you to maintain it, which I'm not always interested in. Um, but in general, I do think more people should write packages. Um, nothing is stopping you from putting it up on GitHub and you can pip install from GitHub these days as well. Um, and it's also like a great exercise, like professionally, like, hey, can I write something that I can reuse? Like that is a great skill, <laughs> like in general. Um, and even if you're doing stuff with pandas, I've also just noticed like, hey, just put the pipeline queries in a separate package so that you can just reuse it. With that in mind, uh, a bit of a pitch. Um, GitHub, coning. Most of my projects are on GitHub. Yeah, this one. So this is a bit of a, it's it's not ready for prime time just yet, but one of the things I think is like a cool example of this. Um, I've been working on this thing called valves. Uh, you know how a pipeline has like a valve that you can turn on and off? So I figured, hey, I have stuff for pandas pipelines, valves might be a good name. Um, and like, I've noticed that there's like a couple of these functions that are just not arbitrary to write, but you want to have them. Stuff like, hey, I have a user column and a timestamp and I just want to sessionize it. And it's kind of a query that, you know, you, yeah, I can, I can see that being useful to multiple companies. And it's also kind of nice for me, at least to have a, a place where, okay, I have a pandas implementation, a Dask implementation, a Polars one and an Ebus one. Uh, and I can also run benchmarks easily this way. Um, but this is also like a really cool example of something I think more people should just go ahead and do. Like if you work in a company and you have a couple of these, like, how do I fetch the right data from a database? That's a great function you want to write once and then have everyone in the team use. Uh, and Python packages are like a great way to the, distribute that. Um, anyway, uh, that, that's my motivational speech when it comes to like writing packages. I try to scratch my own itch, um, often because I'm, I'm interested in writing a certain benchmark and then I don't mind if that's open source. Um, another question, like what's my go-to approach to topic modeling? Um, bulk these days like i really think the visual interface is just kind of nice um there is this thing called bird topic um that i've also recently contributed to uh bird topic is pretty cool the only thing i don't always love about it is that some of the models it uses are pretty heavy so you might need a gpu to use it um however the pr that i made <laughs> makes it a lot more lightweight because you can also just use scikit-learn pipelines uh, to make the embeddings um but uh, people have been telling me that bird topic is kind of nice um, give that a, give that a check. It's, 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 it's made by like a, a Dutch person that I happen to know, Marta. It's, 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 a, it's a definitely a decent package. The only thing is it's a bit heavy. Um, bulk, I think is a pretty reasonable uh, alternative for me at this point. Uh, do you know if there's a free trial for Prodigy for companies? Uh, yes. Um, contact at explosion.ai. Uh, if you're interested in giving Prodigy a spin, uh, we will serve a VM for you and give you SSH access. And you can toy around for about a week or two, and then you can decide if you want to buy it or not. Um, also, like if you have any specific project questions, uh, I'm like one of their support people these days. So if you have any questions, you can also just ask them on the support forum. Um, there's a 50% chance that I'll be picking up your ticket. Uh, 
combining bulk with labeling might be interesting. Have you thought about that? I mean, it's what bulk was made for. Um, so definitely thought about that. Um, there are some extra features coming to bulk at some point. Um, so one of the things I want to add to bulk is um, right now it just only does classification for images and for text, but I would be interested to be able to text substrings in text as well. So I'm thinking about tricks that we can use for that. And also like, can we find images within images? That's also something I would like to bulk label at some point. Uh, not there yet, but that's like definitely uh, something that's in the pipeline. Um, I see the BERT topic thing being shared. Uh, definitely cool. Uh, in your practical experience, does text similarity play a role in transferability? Can you point to some interesting links? I mean, uh, one thing to think about when it comes to like text similarity, right? Um, the word fast and the word slow, are they similar? So I could argue they both describe speed. So that makes them similar. But I can also say, well, fast and slow have the opposite meaning. So they shouldn't, <laughs> so they shouldn't be similar. Okay, so inherently the way natural language works, it makes it very tricky to talk about similarity. Right now, the only way for me to say something is similar is by saying, well, I have some sort of an embedding thing and then I have some sort of distance. And that kind of works, but it has a lot of assumptions in it and we shouldn't assume that it's going to be perfect. There's a lot of awkward things happening inside of uh, embeddings. Uh, like an, another example that I really like from, because um, like words can also have like the same meaning, right? So when I say Brussels, uh, am I talking about the governmental, like am I talking about the European Union or am I actually talking about a city? Like if I if I read a newspaper that Brussels has an opinion, then I think it's a bit about the government and not necessarily about the city itself. Um, and similarly, um, let's say that you're dealing in a chatbot scenario and someone is typing, um, good afternoon. Does that mean hello or goodbye? It depends. <laughs> like if, if someone is saying that at the beginning of the conversation, then it means hello, but good afternoon can also be a way for someone to say good goodbye. So like language is more than a bag of words. It's definitely all kinds of tricky. Um, and then keep that in mind when you're talking about text similarity. Uh, there's a lot of, um, like the reason why I called what lies, uh, the library, what lies is because what lies in, in word embeddings, there's lots of lies in there. Like <laughs> you shouldn't expect magic to happen under the hood. Um, so uh, this, this is also the problem of transferability. Um, if you have, let's say data that's been trained on Reddit and you want to apply it on non Reddit data, uh, then you got to wonder, well, how similar is the text that I have to Reddit? And the same thing with Wikipedia. I remember people tried training word embeddings on Wikipedia and tried using it for uh, chatbots. Uh, they used the same algorithm on Reddit data and the word embeddings from Reddit were better, uh, probably because the spelling on Reddit is more representative of uh, what people do inside of a chat box uh, than the stuff you just read on Wikipedia. Uh, one thing I should maybe also mention, uh, a lot of the tricks that I've shown here today kind of assume English. Uh, and I also want to admit that it's kind of cheating because English is a relatively easy language. Uh, definitely the count factor stuff, like the bag, the more bag of wordsy you kind of go, uh, that sort of those sorts of tricks are definitely easier in English. And I don't want to suggest that they will work as well in other languages. Uh, that said, uh, and better does support models for non-English as well. Um, in particular, there is the LaBase model, L-A-B-S-E. I'm going to type that. Um, that you can find that is pretty good at doing most languages, like many languages, I should say. And like, I believe Arabic is also in there. Uh, I could be wrong, but like, that's uh, one of the things that should uh, also be able to do. Uh, I guess we're nearing the final question. A kind of random, think about this vector representation of words. In your personal opinion, um, how much do you think this assumption holds? Um, like what assumption in, in word embeddings are we talking here? Is it the king queen thing? Mark? Oh, um, so the, the assumption, can you represent each word by a vector? Uh, no. I mean, like realistically, um, this is also a fun example. Um, I, let's say let, I'm gonna I'm gonna say a sentence that has four words. Oh, five. Sorry. Um, 
the man eats a lion and the lion eats a man. Those are the same five words, right? So I can have a word embedding for each and um, I can take the average of all the word embeddings. I would have the same representation for both sentences, even though a completely different thing is being communicated, <laughs> right? <laughs> a lion eating a man is something that happens way more often than a man eating a lion. So yeah, you can try to vectorize a whole bunch of stuff. And sometimes it's actually quite like empirically, you do get reasonable stuff that comes out. But you should always remember it's not really how language actually works. Language is not like, hey, a token goes into a vector and that's how we create sentences and, and grammar. That's that's a bit of a stretch. It just so happens that if we do this on large chunks of data, we do seem to get something out that can be used as, as some vague uh, similarity measure. And that's useful, but it's not how language actually works. And the same thing also holds for like images, right? Uh, or um, if you're doing recommenders, um, these embeddings are more of a um, side of like a, a side effect of training on a label. And they're like a byproduct, like a very useful byproduct, but they're not. But they're not like a, a theory of everything. <laughs> it's more of a useful byproduct. That's kind of the way I would describe that. Um, so, uh, general question, but advice for people who want to get into NLP, uh, current interesting NLP challenges and problems that you see right now. I mean, I'm not much of an academic, so I'm not going to be able to advise anyone on what's state of the art. But if you want to get into NLP, just pick an interesting problem. Um, I got into NLP by saying, hey, I want to detect programming languages in text, uh, which turns out to be a pretty tricky problem, if you think about it. Um, there's this programming language called Go. And there's also this really common verb called go. Um, so how can you train an algorithm to detect that go is not a verb, but a computer uh, programming language instead? That's actually not super arbitrary. Um, you, need, you need to do more than string matching there in order to make that work. Um, what I would do if you want to get into NLP, um, just try to pick a problem that's semi-interesting, something that could lead to a blog post. And then just, you know, um, check the blogs, check some PyData talks, maybe check, there's a couple of these subreddits on NLP, uh, do that um, and just work on a problem that way. Um, another thing I do recommend people do, like if you want to get good at, uh, you know, online presence and stuff, um, like this is my personal blog, Koning.io, I have stopped writing these long form blogs and instead I've resorted more to like these today I learned kinds of blogs. And really what I do is like, hey, here's a pretty neat idea of like, a, there's a Spacey library or a plugin in Spacey called Ascent. And it does a pretty cool trick for sentiment. And it's really just, you know, a, a quick description of two screenshots and here's the thing it does. Um, and that's a thing I learned today. And this is like a, a, a really easy way to do blogging, but it's also a really cool way to do journaling. Because if you wrote a blog post about it, it's much easier for you to go, oh, I remember that from a year ago. So that's also something I re remind you do if you're doing NLP stuff, like make these notes and uh, if possible, make them just public. Um, if you're interested, like a thing I try to collect much of, by the way, on these tills, I just data sets with mistakes in them. Um, so there is the self-driving car data set, for example, where um, I think it was like two, yeah. So like one and a half percent of all the images um, had like uh, pedestrians missing. <laughs> And for like a self-driving car data set, that's like really bad. <laughs> like you don't want that. <laughs> um, but I really like to collect these uh, data sets with issues in them. And I try to sort of describe um, the issue and uh, et cetera. Uh, like there's another really, really cool one. Um, like, so, you know, Flight Simulator? Uh, Flight Simulator used to be based on open street maps. <laughs> but then there's this one guy who like did a bit of a rounding error on his house. <laughs> um, so like uh, he just wrote some sort of bonkers number in and Flight Simulator actually just copied that. <laughs> um, so like back in the day, you actually had this video game where like there was a skyscraper in the middle of like a suburban area in Melbourne, <laughs> which was a total like data error. But the hilarious result was, was like this sort of science fiction <laughs> mega tower in the middle of it. Uh, and it was also like a really fun one with like Tesla. So like, you know how you have a, te when you're in the Tesla car, it has like a screen of stuff it tries to predict. So there was this one guy like driving around. It was like all these stoplights sort of in the middle of the road. Uh, turns out it was like a truck <laughs> carrying stoplights. 
I just, just kind of thought like, oh man, we need to like, want to start a blog, like do stuff like this, like collect these interesting examples and let's, let's make this more popular on the internet uh, or whatever short-term uh, lessons you've learned in NLP. Like if you want to get started with NLP, this is also like a great way to do it. <sighs> okay. Uh, and I really have been talking for about two hours now. So I, uh, this, this is probably the time to maybe call it quits. Um, if people have like some some short questions, I definitely will still be around, but uh, I'm pretty sure people have a place to be and uh, things to do. Um, definitely, um, yeah. So keep an eye on Explosion. I'm working on cool tools there. Um, if you like Calm Code, super cool, free resource. Keep checking it. Uh, but yeah, uh, Explosion, Prodigy, that sort of thing. Uh, that's what I'll be working on the next uh, couple of months. Oh, uh, final, final pitch, final pitch, uh, NormConf. Um, if you haven't heard about it already, uh, this is something that Vicky Boyk has started. Um, this is a great conference. It's a free conference. Check it out. Uh, I'm also speaking here. Uh, if you like the stuff I'm talking about here, uh, NormConf. It's, it's like PyData, but it's more about more of the day-to-day -day grindy stuff. Uh, check this out if you haven't, if you haven't done it already. Thank you very much, Vincent, for this wonderful talk and sharing some of the tips, tips and tricks for work without using any of this deep learning stuff. Thanks a lot. I mean, the, the pre-trained language models do use deep learning. It's just that I'm, I'm not using a GPU. That's the trick, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also think it's, it's, it's really nice that you brought up the point about how complex language actually is and that in NLP, sometimes we tend to forget how insanely complex it actually is and sometimes we really need to be reminded about that so I mean, this was it's, it's a good point it's not just in so um, uh, i also want to make a point same also holds for like medical imaging i think <laughs> and also there people are surprisingly optimistic um if people are interested by the way um emily bender she's she's amazing yeah yeah and so so i will say like she has this one book uh, yeah, linguistic fundamentals for natural language processing. I will say, like, I bought the first one. It's by all measures like a pretty good book. I will say it, it reads a bit academic, which is not my background. So I, I do get the feeling that it helps if you're a bit of a linguist. Um, but uh, the first chapter of that book is called "Language is More Than a Bag of Words," and that just like that just deserves repeating. Uh, definitely. Um, We're but, gonna link all of. All of the things we talked about, your blog, Explosion, Emily Bender, like every single link is going to be linked to the description. So people can rewatch it, get all the links, look at all the uh, interesting stuff we talked about. So definitely check it out. And uh, But yeah, Emily Bender is, is really cool. She also goes and does podcasts and uh, she's a really nice speaker. So it's also... I, I could... Nice so I remember the uh, so oh, oh actually if you're interested in learning NLP uh give Rachel Tatman a follow she's like a former colleague of mine from Raza uh, and she does like uh I mean, a Rachel knows her stuff she's done her homework like thousands of times and she she knows a lot about NLP also fairness etc she's also a great educator um but she's also doing like a YouTube thing these days I think she does like a weekly um semi podcast topic thing um so I can definitely imagine if you're, if you're trying to get started that's recommendable um the reason I bring it up is because she was interviewing uh, uh, Emily Bender during a Raza podcast back in the day. And it turns out there's something called the Bender rule, which is if you go to a conference and someone talks about like this great NLP result that you are sitting in the room and then you say, on what language was this trained? Yes. <laughs> apparently, apparently that's something that Emily Bender also uh, popularized, which I don't Because think. usually it's about English, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always about English. Um, the, the uh, yeah and, and non-english nlp oh that's a, like, if you want to do cool stuff in nlp by the way non-english nlp that's also like a good thing to maybe check out yeah, and especially like um like you know how some languages you read them from left to right so all the algorithms kind of assume that and then you meet someone who speaks arabic or hebrew and it's the other way around <laughs> you just kind of go like did the algorithm still work i have no idea i should ask this person uh, there's so many of these assumptions, just so many of them. Um, Actually, Sebastian Ruder is going to talk about um, underrepresented or res low resource languages on the 22nd of November. So, yeah. 
this is definitely it's a good it's going to be a good segue so a lot of assumptions yep um so on that bombshell though i do think i have to go downstairs to my wife and my infant child <laughs> i think i've been, <laughs> been stalling this on it for a while but uh yeah um thank you zoom audience you've been great um remember i'm also available on twitter so if i if, if there's like a question you have later uh feel free to like uh pop in there as well.